But honestly, that's not all. Because today are we, look, we are looking to break our pattern, our routine, our almost set in stone, the concrete to our bedrock, the place we laid our roots. Okay, that's enough of the metaphors. Stay Survival Podcast, bringing you survival news. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the State of Survival Podcast. In this podcast episode, we are going to be covering DayZ. But don't worry, folks, we're actually going to be trying something new today. And while it may seem like we're trying something new on every episode or doing something new every week, we are still getting our feeling for podcasting. And today's episode is no different. Today, we are going to be working with a mixed bag of ideas, and we'll have to discuss that a little bit further. But let's go ahead and ask about our staff and see how they're doing. Yarl, what's up, man? What's been going on? Not much, not much. Uh, figured out the issue I had with Medieval Dynasty, because I was going to stream that on Friday, and it was not detecting my video card. And I thought for a moment, did Starfield kill my display adapter? Nope, I was in the public beta branch for Medieval Dynasty, and it did right? So I had to uninstall it, not do the beta, and now everything's working just fine. Uh, but other than that, as far as the streaming schedule goes, we've got Dungeons & Dragons tomorrow, weather permitting. I think everybody should be there. Starfield, and of course, Arts Chat vs. Streamer Friday night. So definitely tune in. Nice. Very nice. And our producer, Red, how has it been going? Oh, busy, busy as always. Um, doing a little bit of mod work and then uh, doing some... Uh, some gameplay on some new games that are new to me, and we'll, we'll be talking about that in the uh, in the hot takes. Very, very exciting. Very exciting. Well, folks, this week has been a pretty big week for me. I celebrated my 12th marriage anniversary to my wife. And honestly, folks, we've been together for over 20 years. I've been married to my wife since 2003, if you guys want to do the math. And it was awesome. We went down to a nice Indian restaurant, uh, had some delicious food. Um, probably ate way too much than I should up there because the food's just amazing. Um, and then we went to a comedy club, which the main act was amazing. But I will say the opening acts were terrible. It was absolutely <laughs> terrible. Um, I'm really glad the uh, main act guy really saved it because it, 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 it was so bad that like me and my wife were questioning if we wanted to even stay for more than like 20 minutes after the first two people came on but it was a lot of fun and our anniversary was absolutely amazing we celebrated a day early and then sunday was kind of a lazy kind of just mope around the day we played Baldur's gate 3 together and that kind of stuff on our actual anniversary and it was really fun uh, in other news, uh, the State of Survival podcast has actually been producing some uh, videos done by yours truly, um, and it has been awesome, the reception. Our 1.22 update video was just awesome, blew my mind. Um, and then our Green Hell update video, and now our latest uh, highlight video is doing good. And I just wanted to say to the people who are supporting us at YouTube and, and to the newcomers, thank you guys very, very much. I really appreciate it. I know it's supposed to be about me, but Safe Survival Podcast is kind of an extension of what I do. So I just wanted to say that to everybody. But let's go ahead and get into the meat and bones of this episode. Uh, kind of go over what we're going to be changing up that I mentioned when I first started the stream. So uh, today we are going to be talking about Daisy 1.22. But honestly, that's not all. Because today are we, look we are looking to break our pattern, our routine, our almost set in stone, the concrete to our bedrock, the place we laid our roots. Okay, that's enough of the metaphors. As poorly as they were said, today we are going to try a more broad approach, and rather than focus on one game, we will focus on the survival game news in general. So, before we jump in, what survival game or update to a survival game are you most excited about? Let us know in the comments below or right now in chat. Uh, but go ahead and uh, talk about Daisy 1.22. Okay, so Daisy 1.22 came out not too long ago, and it did introduce some new situations. You know, what do you know about Daisy 1.22 just in general? 
from what I knew about it, the thing I walked away from it was it didn't feel as sizable of an update as some of the ones we've seen in the past, but I did get excited about the variety of bags. I always thought that was something that was lacking. Got a little bit of a taste of it in 1.21, and I was just glad that they're kind of expanding on that, giving us more and more bags to work with. Well, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, the bags are definitely a nice addition. So that is definitely some of the new things. They added in a variety of new bags. And it is interesting that they decided to add in more bags because there was another change they did at the same time, which was they reduced and rebalanced uh, how bags spawn in the world overall. They moved larger mountain bags and those kind of bags further north and into the higher tier areas. And then they made it so these bags spawned more commonly uh, down south, kind of bringing into a more of a you get better equipment as you go further north approach and less of a 100% uh, a random chance. Um, you can still find mountain backpacks down south and stuff, but it's not 100%. Um, you know, it it's not a guarantee. Guaranteed. Yeah. Yeah, because one of the strategies I did whenever I spawned is you want a big backpack. First thing you do is just run along the coast and search the boats because underneath you'll either find a fishing pole, a huge dry sack or even some of the bags. Like I, one time I found a mountaineering backpack just right there on a boat right at the coast. And once you find that, it makes that climb because it's a game entirely based off of gear fear, but it makes that climb to get better gear a lot easier than it feels like it should be oh yeah definitely um and it, it's cool because not they didn't just introduce new bags like that go into the same location they introduced new varieties of bags which is ne not necessarily something you get too excited about but it is interesting and i have a little uh, secret nugget i did some testing on and i'll share that with you in just a second but they drew sl slings canvas bags duffels and a improvised wet bag and a fanny pack or what they called it a, a side pouch i think is what they called it um what which one was your favorite location wise because they all kind of had similar locations but they did uh hug the character in different ways i honestly prefer the slings or satchels the ones that are off to the side because you could protect them if you know somebody you know you you have a feeling you might get shot you can face your body towards them and have the bag set out of sight. Nothing is worse than getting your giant red dry bag shot up. And then even if you survive the battle, going into a house to patch up your wounds and finding out that a lot of the gear inside is ruined. Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, that's actually one of the cool things I was actually going to uh, just tell everybody. Uh, you made a great point there. I actually went into a debug mode for day Z and where it shows the fire geometry of all objects and the backpack on a player technically is not um, is where the backpack actually is visually on the player, which is really cool. So exactly what you're saying, Jarl, when somebody starts shooting at you, uh, it's a lot harder of a chance or rather lower of a chance to hit that bag. So definitely can get you out of some nice scrapes because a ruined backpack always sucks for a lot of people. Um, I would have to say, I think my, although it probably isn't the most utilitary, is the improvised wet bag. Um, they finally mm -hmm. took that little wet pouch, uh, that we find all over the coast, which I guarantee you, the only use people found for those is early on Bambi berries, and that's if you found, uh, <laughs> if you found a shovel, which you don't always find a shovel, um, uh, but most people just chuck them, they don't care. Uh, because they are always were in your inventory, and you can't put a bag with items in the inventory into another bag. You have to have an empty bag to put it in your bag. So, being able to just combine a basic rope, which, folks, if you don't know, it's six rags plus six rags equals a rope, and then you can make yourself a improvised bag, which hangs directly on your side hip, uh, like, right below your arm. And it's, like, 20 slots of inventory. Yeah, it uh, is. Which is nice um 20 slots of device. inventory and it keeps all your stuff dry which is oh, huge yeah. because you can keep oh. a lot of like backup clothes in there and then if you're wet and you don't want to get sick you can get out you could dry yourself off and then you can 
pull your dry clothes out of your wet sack while the other ones are drying. So no more running into somebody who's just standing there in their underwear by a fire waiting for their clothes to dry. Yeah, I mean, and the cool thing that y'all um, just brought up, and I just thought of this, is that you can actually deconstruct these bags um, and uh, then bury them later on. So when you do find uh, a shovel, you'd be like, okay, I don't need this one anymore. Tear it, um, take off the rope and bury it. And there you go. You have yourself kind of like a portable, bury buryable thing, much like the dry sacks you find um, further um, in the villages and stuff. So that's really cool. Um, I will have to say, <laughs> I know Daisy tries to name things differently because I think that's kind of just how they like to do things. You know, the AKM is technically not really a real gun. It's based off the AK variants. Um, or, you know, whatever. But, uh, it's cool that they do that, but at the same time, it's silly because they literally called one of the bags that are on your side a duffel bag, and it does not look like a duffel bag. It, it looks nowhere close to a duffel bag that I know of. Um, I even googled it, and I tried to find a duffel bag that looks like it, like, rests on your side and is, like, that small of a thing, and I'm like, I, I, I just don't see it. So that was kind of an interesting name choice for that kind of bag. You want to know something cool about the AKM, though? Oh, yeah. It's, ac it's actually a real gun that was designed oh. where they replaced the AK-47 with more reliable components. But the idea of it was to kind of replicate the M16's ability for attachments. But oftentimes it just gets confused with an AK-47 because even then you can't do everything that you can with an American assault rifle on it. So, so, so like even the name is real because mm -hmm. a lot of people yeah. say the name doesn't even exist. Oh, that's interesting. No, so the AK-47 was developed in the late 50s and then the AKM was the basically the improved model of it that didn't have a lot of the shortcomings that the AK-47 had. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Well, yeah. Hey, learn something new every day, folks. That's uh, actually really cool. Right? Now, let's go ahead and talk about kind of what the title says right there. Update to fix or break. They put a lot of uh, uh, fixes into this game. And it was cool to see. But kind of with every Daisy update, there's going to be things that break. However, it seems like this time more things broke than they wanted or that the community was prepared to have. And uh, folks, I don't know if you folks actually watch a channel on YouTube called Wobo. He is a very statistic driven and very much a breakdown video kind of guy about daisies, mechanics, physics, you name it. Um, and he showed off one where the shotgun uh, is only registering one pellet from the buckshot uh, hitting. And it doesn't matter if you shoot with a double barrel or a single shot. Uh, there will only be one if they're shot in the same second. It's good to know that this does not affect bullets that are shot from a magazine or a semi-automatic or whatever. Because the bullets do, like, skip a frame before they get shot again. It's just when all of the pellets or the bullets are shot at once, um, it only, only one of them is registered as a damage-dealing object. So if you folks are running out there with shotguns, uh, go ahead and go watch Wobo's video. Literally, you can just Google search, I mean, YouTube search it and be like, Wobo. Um, and you'll see that video. But it's a good thing to know if you uh, like to run around with shotguns like I do. Uh, just be careful of that buckshot. But there are other you know, uh, it, It's funny but, that you mentioned that, too, because... I was celebrating our video and I was really excited about it. I went and watched as much as I could on 122 and the general excitement the day after was like, yeah, another update. But as I've because I've been way too busy with new releases to touch Daisy again. And as I've been watching more and more videos of people playing it, the excitement has dwindled into frustration. <laughs> and it's it's kind of frustrating to see see it happen like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, and this happens with a lot of Daisy updates, but it's more prominent with this update as more mm -hmm. and more things are being shown. And it's awesome that they're focusing on bug fixing. It's awesome that, yes, we are still getting content, but it's not as much content as most people would like. Um, but it is kind of also, I think, frustrating to a lot of, I believe, more or less 
console players than anything else because in PC something breaks a modder can fix it um, right if something happens with your server a change in the code or whatever um you know your server owner have their modder team or whatever fix it but consoles kind of stuck with the vanilla code they can't really change it they can make really cool things like my friend always streams told me the other day they have a live gps marker uh you know, Discord mod or whatever, where when you actually open up the in-game map, it uses in-game records to log the person's coordinates put into the console, and then it sends it back to the person on the server so you can see exactly where you are in, like, a really small diameter, which is a vanilla feature, but in vanilla, it's, like, a good, like, 500-meter or 800-meter radius. But on console, these people made it down to a 5-meter radius area, so you know almost exactly where you are on the map. On console. Kind of cool. Yeah, and I can imagine the frustration for, for console players, too, because it always seems like they're they're thought of last, you know, the, you know, in that kind of development cycle. But also, whenever there's an update like that, it updates your servers. And if it's really messy and you've got a pop in server, it's not something you could fix out with mods, like you said. Um, cause as a player, I have the luxury on PC of joining any server I want that has any kind of mods I want. But if you're a server owner and you have these mods and you got everything working and you're spinning plates and everything's splitting, and then all of a sudden they can't spin the plates anymore. I could see why that would be so frustrating because there's nothing you could do about it. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, you know, uh, they did fix a lot of cool things. They fixed uh, car sounds not being heard when inside of the network bubble. They fixed tons of other stuff. All right, folks, let's go ahead and stop talking about Daisy 1.22, and let's move on to Enshrouded. Uh, Enshrouded is an amazingly up-and-coming game. If you folks have been here for our last podcasts, you all did an amazing episode covering this game. And I think it's time for us to revisit because they've had a closed beta since then. And there has been some really cool developments uh, doing that. Now, what we know is that Enshrouded, if you guys uh, don't know about our last video, uh, is a voxel-based survival game with elements of a uh, RPG kind of situation in it. You have leveling and everything else with a good storyline talking about your ancestors made a grave mistake and over uh, caused an issue. And the shroud down below is something where bosses and other kinds of rare materials and everything else are happening. But you have a little bit of safety up above where you can build and everything else. It's kind of the rough, maybe a little bit mistaken parts of it, uh, breakdown of a shrouding. It's a voxel game, so it's going to have a lot of possibilities. And part of that closed beta was testing out all of those possibilities with base building. Uh, now, first off, we're going to talk about the new, the shown off of survival and exploration video they put out recently. Yarl, did you get a chance to watch it? What'd you think? I did a little bit, but honestly, I'm also trying to keep the hype down. <laughs> um, I absolutely got excited when I saw Shrouded, and I thought that the reports that we got from those that have experienced more of the gameplay are truly good news. But at the same time, I want to see more of what comes closer to the final product without getting hyped too much. The builds are amazing, yeah, by the way. Yeah. Some uh -oh. of those builds, you forget it's a voxel game. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, it's just ab absolutely amazing. Um, the video that we posted, folks, right there in chat, and we will post in the description below, is the uh, short video of the survival and exploration mechanics, uh, which is really cool. Um, and you know what? It was nice to see them making these short videos. Now, they're not, let's say, like short videos. They're not the uh, 1080 by 1920 shorts. They're just you know, one or two or three minutes long, and they just explain what they're doing, what mechanics they're working on. Um, I have to say, I'm very impressed with how open Keen is being, with the Keen Game Studios being with the community. Um, they're doing amazing work, and they're willing to show it off. They're proud of it. You can tell with a lot of the things that they're doing, like 
YouTube video wise and short wise and all that kind of stuff, like on TikTok and stuff, they're proud to show off what people did in closed beta. They're that confident in how closed beta went that they're all like, look at all these cool things. And some might say, oh, no, they're only showing off the things that, you know, are awesome. I think that's not necessarily true. I think that's literally being like, no, these are the things that we think were amazingly awesome people did, but we still thought the beta was awesome in all aspects. And I think the other cool thing about it, too, is whenever you hear about Enshrouded and people talk about the survival mechanics, some people embrace the fact that it seems very similar to Valheim. Some people get grizzled by that because they didn't really feel like Valheim was a survival game. I appreciate these little short form videos because they're showing that while similar to Valheim, there's going to be a lot more to it to give it a lot more depth. Uh, combat, for one, I think the combat from what we've seen even before the beta showed that it's going to be more in depth. But it's nice that the survival is getting a little more of a layer to it. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. The other cool thing is they before they actually started fully showing off all of the cool builds that people were doing in closed beta, they have also been very active on their social media and not just posting videos. They every now and then, and we um, actually participate in these, uh, post a screenshot. And then they're all like, I think the one uh, that we're about to post is, uh, and there'll be a description down below too, uh, was literally like, uh, you did something wrong and you're locked in one of these cages above this bridge. What, uh, what, oh, no, what did you do? What was your crime to be put in the cage <laughs> floating above the bridge? And people came up with really uh, creative uh, solutions, including us. Um, I forget exactly what we said. But, you know, you'll have to go look at it if you want to find out. But it was, it's fun because they're not only just being all like, hey, look at what other people did, or hey, look at this cool thing that we're developing. It's literally being all like, hey guys, um, let's just actually build a community. Let's engage with people. And I actually like that. What do you think about that kind of stuff, Yarl? I love it. And although I'm not expecting there to be bird cages, uh, you know, inside your base that's functioning, it would be dope if it was. One of my favorite things about Reign of Kings before the or Reign of Kings, before the developer just took all the money and stopped working on it was that it gave like it wasn't uncommon to be running by a, a tavern and seeing the guards of the king arrest somebody and have them in a bird cage and it made you go why are you here what are you what did you do um and i love the fact that they're kind of building into that creative they're they're letting you build that rp lore with what they have in the game because it's just that's the kind of layer that you get underneath it we always say with DayZ, it's about the world you create. It's about the story you create. The story is something you write from the start of you washing up onto the beach to the moment that life slips away from your fingers. And that's what I love about those games. But the fact that they're getting the entire community hyped up into that kind of collaborative storytelling, it makes me really excited for the multiplayer potential in the future. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it's really cool because that's one of the success stories about DayZ itself is that it built a community alongside building a game. Um, now, that community was there from the mod days, but they embraced that community, they adopted it, they made it better, they encouraged it to be there. And I think Enshrouded isn't necessarily taking a page from DayZ, but they're definitely looking at all of the different types of games that have come out, and they're all like, how can we make this get a good reception while making an amazing game, but also keep it going long term. Because that's one of the things I see with a lot of survival games. They don't engage with their audience enough, and that game fizzles out in attention because a lot of these early access survival games are early access folks, and not all the features are there enough to keep people playing for months on end. Um, but what is cool, and we just talked, we were talking about the beta builds, Jarl. Uh, they compiled all of the short videos and everything else they did, and they made a long video of all of the beta builds that people did during beta, uh, in closed beta, actually, uh, which was really cool to see. Um, there were some of my favorite ones, but y'all, did you have a favorite in there? You know, honestly, I think the, the favorite one that I had was the uh, Cozy Starter Cabin. Because to me, it reminded me of those old um, uh, Tom King. Who's that artist? Thomas Kincaid. Those like 
classic Christmas cabins. And normally the builds I saw were giant arcane towers, big castles, medieval village. But this really just looked like a humble piece of pie in a Christmas setting. And I love that it gives you that kind of leeway instead of just making a replica of Carcassonne in France. You can just have like your little own ranch. You don't have to have a walled city. And I, I love that. I love the creativity there. Yeah, I, I definitely love the creativity overall, folks. I think one of my favorite things in there uh, was actually um, a Japanese uh, style home. Uh, gorgeous, beautiful archways, everything like that. They but, did it better than really Sengoku. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, what really shocked me is the detail in these buildings. Um, mm -hmm. There's literally a person who made a uh, stone house, like a stone building, and then like built a forge area and stuff like that. But they took the time to remove the voxels in between the stone to make it look like it was stone bricks. And they did it in such a way where it looked like it was naturally hewed stone. Uh, now, folks, you don't know the difference between hewed stone and chiseled stone. Uh, it's definitely a very interesting different technique. Hewed stone is like, if you ever see someone build a stone wall in a farm or whatever, that's kind of like hewed stone. Yeah, they make the rocks fit together and then they put in the mud and that kind of stuff if you need to. But a lot of times, hewed stone literally just settle, sits on itself. It's a very a very natural gravity-based wall. Uh, and it's really cool. I might be getting the word wrong. But no, no, you're right. There's there's still huge stone fences built in the medieval ages in England and Ireland that have been there for hundreds, if not thousands of years, which is insane because it's just gravity that holds it down. Yeah. And I think the last thing that impressed me was the variety the community brought to the game. Even the closed beta, the amount of different people playing the game showed mm. that this wasn't just an audience from North America or Europe or Asia or whatever. This was an audience who appreciated around the world architecture and were able to recreate it in this game using their beautiful voxel based build base building system. Um, and I actually really like that. I appreciate that that possibility is there that you can make kind of whatever you want. It reminds me a lot of Minecraft but a lot smaller for. Yes, and what I really like about it, because Minecraft, we all got excited when they released the vines, right? But if you put vines on your house in Minecraft, sometimes they just grow and you have to put something underneath it so that after a few days, your house doesn't just look like a plant or a bush. I love the fact that you can be more intricate on where you place your vines. And uh, there, there was like a cliffside manor. I don't remember the name of it in the video. But one of the things I noticed in it was that they put keystones where keystones should be. And I know it's towards the end of the video, but I love that. I love that you could be as realistic or as fantasiful as you want. If you want an arcane tower with beauty and just magical omnipresence, then you can build that. Or if you want to make something that looks like it was actually built in an Italian villa, you could do that as well. And I love that level of detail. All right, now, folks, we are running a little bit uh, long on the entrada time, but I do want to cover they did post a tech demo. I call it a tech demo because it's literally them showing off with a little bit of humor. Uh, I think they even like jokingly mentioned that. Why am I throwing grenades? That's a bug. Um, but they're blowing up the environment. They're blowing up the voxel environment and showing you just how dynamic it is when you use explosives. And what's cool because when you think about people testing with you know mortars or explosives or grenades or bombs or kamehamehamehas um you know it's really cool to see how the voxel system dynamically chooses what voxels to destroy or not to destroy um and you can actually see there's a little bit of a blast radius with the bug <laughs> grenades bug uh that they showed off and you can actually see where it looks like there's shrapnel going through some of the area that it um, exploded in, uh, which is really nice because um, it shows that they're actually experimenting with more projectile systems. So like, uh, you know, trebuchets or catapults or even like explosive arrows might have more of a damaging effect than uh, people think. 
I also like how the explosions are round, like the craters are spherical in shape, which is awesome to do in a voxel environment, because let's face it, even in Space Engineers, it looks a little Play-Doh-y and warped, and in Minecraft, it looks like an 8-bit crater. But I love that it looks so real when you blow something up with a grenade. It's really dope. Yeah, that was awesome. That was awesome. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and go over to our hot takes. So, here we are with our hot takes. Uh, first up is our one and only producer, Red. <clears throat> one and only is right. <clears throat> so, um, played a few new games for me um, and wanted to talk about them. So the first one is Sunken Land. Um, it is uh, early release, so I have to emphasize, set your expectations accordingly. It's playable, but uh, they are adding new things as they go. So this Sunken Land is basically, you can imagine Rust meets Waterworld. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of water. You start with the island that you can see <clears throat> um, in the picture here. And this one actually has a bit of a base that somebody built on it. So it does have base building. Um, it also has uh, diving, and that's what makes it really exciting, is you can see here you're actually diving underwater. There's an oxygen meter, so that shows you how long you can be underwater. And then in this case, we're actually looking at a, a car wreck, which when you swim closer to it, you get an option to search. And so that's how you do your looting. Um, and you'll get metal and cloth and some other things. There's entire sunken cities and villages, uh, lots of exciting things. There's also fish. There's the big swordfish that look pretty sketch. And then there's sharks that will try to take a bite out of you. Um, there are other players. Right now it's basically in a co-op mode if you're playing uh, with that way. So it's a limited number of players. But uh, if they have friendly fire on, you can go bang on the other players if you like. Um and then there's the usual crafting. Like I said, anybody who plays Rust and enjoys Rust, I think will really get a kick out of Sunken Land because it's just a different take. They, they really fleshed out the underwater uh, section. And Sunken Land gives a lot of love to Hammerhead Sharks, which I love because <laughs> not enough games do that. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And then the second game I wanted to talk about is uh, Rooted. So Rooted is in, they just opened their closed alpha release under NDA, so I can't give any real details, unfortunately, but uh, uh, Rooted is uh, based on Unreal Engine 5, so the graphics, they're really going over the top uh, with that. It also means that, <clears throat> as usual, they increase performance and uh, graphic capabilities. Uh, that puts anybody with a lower-end machine at a disadvantage. So if you have a higher end graphics card, you can really get the the nice views of things. Um, this uh, closed alpha also really helped me recalibrate what I thought of as an alpha release, a beta release, early release, and then done. Because there are so many games now that never really reach that done state. They can be 10 years in, in the early release or beta release. Um, and uh, so that was something when we went through uh, Sengoku, I kind of looked at it and went, really, this isn't even half done, in my opinion. But now I can see, looking at what a closed alpha is, it's basic functionality. So by the time they get to an early release or even an open beta, it's, it's still going to be a lot of their vision won't be completed, but it'll be playable. Um, so that was just kind of an insight that I had. Um, one thing I can say is that uh, the Rooted team has been very, very responsive and interactive with the uh, with the people that are testing. Uh, it's a Kickstarter-based game, so it's been very community-supported. Um, they've done a number of uh, patch releases and updates. I know they've got a big one coming out tomorrow that they said is going to close out like 1,500 tickets that were put in for things that were found. And the, the alpha crew that's testing it are really putting it through its paces. So we're doing all kinds of things like uh, breaking out of the contained area, you know, trying all kinds of crazy things that a normal player wouldn't wouldn't think of and a, a dev wouldn't consider. Why would anybody do that? 
Um, so it's been a lot of fun, and I think it's going to be a great game once it comes out. Here you can see a picture. This is one of their stock photos of some of their base building capabilities. Um, so very exciting. Wait, how? I appreciate that ghosting, by the way, because you can see through it. The ghosting in a lot of survival games, it's this blue hologram, but you can't see through it. So if there's a creature coming to attack you, you can't see it until it's too late. And I really like the way they did it there. Exactly. Well, nice. Okay, that's all I had. All okay, right. Y'all, you're up. I'll take the reins here. Listen, I've been doing a lot of research on the upcoming survival games for 2023, and a lot of them have been pushed back to 2024. And I've been snooping through the communities, and I see backlash, nothing but backlash. And that's a little frustrating to me, because I think the biggest problem that we have in gaming nowadays is when we're sold a final product, it's not even final. It's missing a lot of components, and it could have been put off for six months. I think Fallout 76 and Cyberpunk was a breaking point for a lot of people. So while I do sympathize with people's excitement when they hear that a game is delayed or pushed back because they want to put final polish on it, we can't have our cake and eat it too. We certainly don't want them to release an unfinished product, but at the same time, we do want them to release it in a timely fashion. So if a product has to get pushed back six months to a year, just remember they're trying to refine it so that when it releases, there's as few issues as possible. And if a company does delay, 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 and still release a broken product, you, the consumer, can choose to no longer support that company. So I advocate for delays if a project is not near its completed state, or as like Red said, what they had a vision for their completed state. And all I'm saying for my hot take is be patient, join the forums, the, the dev team or the marketing team oftentimes talks with the people there and you can get a great feel for how they appreciate their communities and whether or not they're just delaying it because they have major bugs or if they're trying to make it the game of your dreams. So that's my hot take. That is awesome. That is very awesome. I actually I actually enjoy that. Um, it's a very good thing to state because uh, patience is a very good thing to have when it comes to games because the payoff is always worth it when you wait for a game to be more polished. I totally agree on that. Yeah, like if Cyberpunk um, released a year later, it would have been probably the best game that we've seen in a decade, you know? Yeah. I mean, look at it now. It's freaking Yeah, awesome. it's amazing. Oh, man. Well, you know, it kind of makes me think, do I break format from these two guys talking about their survival games and their survival views, or do I stick with what I originally wanted to talk about? Let's go ahead and break format, folks. Let's go ahead and talk about uh, you um, being a content creator and a streamer overall, and let's talk about the expectations of this real quick. I actually had a conversation with one of my friends the other day, and we were talking, and... There are tons of videos about, you know, you know, it sucks when you're expecting your videos to do better than the video, the, the last video you did, or you don't get more views because, you know, they call it the viewer creep, right? If you had 10 viewers last time you streamed or 100 views on your video last time you had it, you expect to get more, right? Well, what I actually experienced and what I think actually a lot of people experience is actually the opposite. I'm okay with my video doing exactly as good as the video before it. Um, actually, I'm, I'm thrilled when it does. What I don't like, and I know a lot of other people out there don't like, is when it underperforms compared to my other videos or my last video, where my last video was 100 views, and now this video was only 90 views, or I had 10 views last stream, and now I only have five. That kind of feeling really gets you down. And I'm here to tell you folks, don't believe it. Views on videos and um, people watching you stream are always volatile. Your viewer numbers can go up and down all the time. One of my buddies, Red Run Streams, does DayZ, and his numbers can vary from, you know, 25 people watching him one, one stream to, like, over 100 plus. And this goes for my other people that I like to watch stream. Uh, uh, stream. Minder, for a good example, just came back to streaming, and he has quite a vo volatile audience. Well, yes, he does have a default audience. That number can go below it. So my overall hot take here, folks, is even if you see those numbers happening, they happen, you know, two or three streams after you've had a high peak, 
don't let that doubt get in your head. It just means that people aren't around. People are busy doing things, and maybe they'll come and watch. Just keep pushing, keep making content, and keep streaming, folks. That's kind of my hot take. All right, folks. Our next survival game we're going to be talking about is good old Rusty. I mean, Rust. Uh, Rust is a very interesting game overall. It plays into a lot of the dynamics and interesting survival features we enjoy well, I would say almost giving it a more casual approach to survival, but a harder approach to PvP and PvP rating of bases. If you look up almost any Rust video, it's not a, I survived uh, five hours in Rust uh, with just a rock. It's a, I broke into a base with just a rock, or 10,000 of my fellow, or uh, 50 of my other fellow players destroyed the most elite base on the server or whatever. And Rust really focuses on this PvP aspect, this raiding aspect, this him hard peer play with your play with your friends, build up better bases, and destroy the other bases in the area situation. And in this most recent update, the Airborne update, they introduced some really cool things. Yarl, have you ever had a chance to really enjoy Rust? I don't enjoy Rust. I've played it a lot, and I do not enjoy it. Uh, for me. I like to get immersed in my survival games, which is why I love Daisy. Daisy, I see, is very practical. Rust, I can't get over crossing a hill and expecting to see a landscape that is both dangerous and beautiful, only to see 400 towers with weapons all over them dotted across the landscape and not being able to do much before someone naked decides to beat me in the head with a rock. And if you kill that someone, there's 40 more naked people behind the hill waiting for you. Um, but what I do like about Rust is Rust is always adding different, um, different styles of play. You can be the lone wolf that has a fortified base surviving on your own. You could play with a few friends, you know, being defensive, keeping people away from your camp. You could even role play within some servers and do some trade. And I think to that regard, Rust is very, very well done. Uh, but for me, it's a little too unpredictable when it comes to the type of people who are playing and some of the things that happen. Oh, yeah. I mean, there. you know, you're right. There is a lot of different play styles and the unpredictability can be different. Um, but in this update, I think that they are trying to help give more end game situations as well as better defenses. This is one thing I actually appreciate about Rust is it seems like every time they give you a new rocket launcher, there's a better base building object to make. They give you, mm -hmm. in this instance, a, an attack helicopter. They gave you a homing missile launcher. So, like, uh, you're not 100% always either on the defensive or on the offensive with these updates, which is really nice to see them balancing it. Because I've seen many updates where, for example, I hate to always go back to this, but DayZ, when they introduced satchels and uh, improvised explosives and all that kind of stuff when it comes to, like, base rating they didn't introduce anything to help base rating right uh to defend it was all base rate all uh, base attack not base defend situations and i'm happy that rust looks at that balance and goes okay if we're gonna add something harder hitting let's make something um strong enough and make it so the resources are somewhat equal in building effort um but the new content is a attack helicopter. Have you seen this thing in motion yet? I've watched a few of the YouTube videos on it and I freaking love it. I, I told I showed a picture to my wife and I was like, babe, I cannot get it out of my head that this just looks like somebody went to a go kart store and built a chopper. And I love that aspect. It's so Dawn of the Dead with the bus, like the zombie killing bus that they built. And I love that idea of like, Let's make a helicopter because it seems like there's no limit to the creativity and they kind of reinforce that with the designs of the vehicles they release. They could have easily put a little bird or, or an Apache in, but they didn't. They, they really kept with that whole you build it and it looks like you built it. Yeah. That it is is awesome. It is awesome. Uh, there are some bugs with it. <laughs> I did see someone get into the pilot seat and open their inventory, and the helicopter stayed on even after they exited it. Oh and it's no! Just going in circles no. around their little landing pad, and they're running after it, going stop, stop. 
<laughs> Obviously, it takes a lot of materials to build these things. Otherwise, they'd be like, who cares? Blow it up. Um, but it was hilarious. And then we have the homing missile launcher, which is actually uh, pretty cool. Um, definitely does not look like something you construct. It looks more like something you find. Uh, but it's awesome. Uh, I'm happy that they did that. The whole balance thing I just talked about. Uh, and it, what's cool is you can actually hear it trying to lock. I know that I'm not sure if that's 100% realistic. Uh, actually, no, we have a person actually, uh, a producer is an uh, oh, ex-helicopter pilot. Red, do you actually know if that's a real thing? Do things actually tell you if you're sound-wise locking on things? Oh, absolutely. Um, oh, and, nice. it, and it varies depending on if it's uh, infrared-based or um, uh, active radar-based. So you'll get a different kind of tone. Uh, you probably heard it in movies. The uh, the infrared kind of has a buzzing noise, like a brrrr, until it gets locked on and then beep. And there you go. Nice. nice. I always thought that was like kind of like a quality of life situation, but it's cool to know it's realistic. Yeah. Um, and they added in parachutes. Uh, that is pretty cool. I did watch a video on this and literally as if you hit anything, the parachute uh, pretty much collapses. So do be wary of trees. Uh, you can repack it, uh, so that's good to know. Um, and then, they I'm not sure if you've played this uh, rest enough, Yara, but they have hot air balloons. <laughs> and you can actually <laughs> make armored hot air balloons now. <laughs> that is awesome. That's awesome. Like, I think my favorite thing about Rust is... It's my favorite thing, but it's also the reason why I have to leave it for the sake of my own humanity when I do play it. It's that it really does feel like somebody took the Xbox lobbies back from the Halo 2 days and threw them in a Mad Max situation. So I love that they're embracing it, but it gets crazy. So why not have hot air balloons like a like the Zeppelins of World War One, where they had armor plating on them? Why not? I think that's genius. Yeah. It is genius. It is genius. Um, it is to be noted, folks, you cannot put a lock on these hot, armor, uh, hot air balloons and... Um, sorry. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so that's something to remember. Uh, they introduced weapon racks and tool racks. These are really awesome. You can put pretty much anything in there, and they're completely dynamic where things can be put, which is a very welcome feature in Rust, especially when I played it with uh, Red Falcon, our producer, a while back. Being able to store things and easily access them without having to find, like, that one chest with all the tools... Uh, was kind of problematic. So it's kind of cool that you can now put a weapon rack up and have like guns or whatever else, fully geared by the way, uh, ready to go uh, just at a moment's grab. They did do some other optimizations. So I'm going to blow through these really quick to uh, folks because a lot of these aren't going to be super important to talk about. Yarl, if you hear one, go ahead and stop me and tell me what, tell me what you think. Uh, view distance increase without performance hits. Uh, yes. Corey models. Oh. <laughs> I, I really that, think good. I really think that that was needed in Rust because again, when you're dealing with people who are sniping, when you're just starting out, I had a horse one time and I'm like, all right, let's go survive, and I got pegged. There was no way I could see him, so I ramped up the view distance, and it really stressed the system out. So I'm very glad that they did that. Yeah, definitely improved quarry models and furnaces. A furnace, so they remake remade the quarry models and the furnace model. I have not seen them, but I would be excited to see them soon. Uh, can stack fluid switches now, which it looks look nice. There is a new UI. Looks like they overhauled the UI. New cl uh, cl uh, collider triggers. World edges repel instead of kill. I will talk about this one real quickly. Uh, when the world edges are essentially the ocean world edges, and it would immediately kill you. Now what it does is it literally, it, it says repel, but repel is a strong word for it, uh, or rather not a strong word for it. Uh, it will actually uh, push you back to the shore, which then goes to another optimization they did, which is if you leave boats out in the middle of the water, uh, they will float back to the shore over time. So if you're killed out in the ocean by a shark or whatever else, your boats will eventually come back to the shore, which... Folks, is a very realistic feature about mm -hmm. islands, by the way. Um, and then let's go ahead and go with the future works in progress. I know we sound like we're blowing through all this stuff, but the new content was really where the meat of the bones of this update was. Uh, there's tons of other fixes. Uh, I hope you folks do look at the update video that we're uh, about to post if you guys are interested in the other stuff. 
but the works in progress are linking up below and uh, above ground networks, which is really cool because it's actually interesting that some of the uh, silos and stuff I went into, I didn't realize that they, I was going into a different network than uh, my uh, than my friends up above. So that's really cool that they're doing that. Um, it means there's probably going to be less network desync when you come back up or go below to help friends. Uh, tutorial Island. It looks like they are making possibly a option to go to a Tutorial Island when you first buy the game or whatever else. Um, we've talked about tutorials in the past before, and honestly, for Rust, I can see ha having a good bearing. Uh, I think I complained about it a while ago, uh, where quality of life-wise and common sense-wise, in Rust, you can't just smack any rock. You have to find a certain rock to get rocks from. Um, Boulder, I think. Uh, which is just frustrating because you think you can just smash the small rock on the coast or whatever, and you can get some small stones, but you can't. Uh, then they're also talking about introducing a Nexus system. So, folks, if you don't know what the Nexus is, the Nexus is a online website that provides a lot of mods. They even have their own mod app to help to deploy to stuff. I know, Jarl, you use the Nexus system quite a bit for some of your stuff, don't you? Oh, yeah, I use Vortex all the time, which is the Vor uh, Nexus mod app, and it's fantastic because it'll auto load order your mods. It'll help you troubleshoot modding. If you're ever afraid to mod, um, Vortex is probably the easiest of the mod managers that I've ever used, and I love it. I actually subscribe to Nexus because I love it that much. Nice, nice. Yeah, I think there's actually uh, some cool things they can do with it. One of the things that I know of is that people can, uh, that make mod managers can put in a server override for mod load orders. So server owners out there who run Rust servers, with the Nexus uh, Vortex, if it does work with Rust, you can literally tell clients how to set up their load order before they connect to your server. So you don't have those conflicts of mods or not loading properly and stuff, which is really nice. And then we have, you know, miscellaneous items, new buildings, skins, etc. Uh, just kind of adding new things to the game, but a lot of the stuff is still mystery. It's just in the books to be done. So yeah, I think it's cool that Rust is uh, still working on it. I mean, I think Rust has been around for like what, six, seven years now. Pretty old game. Yeah, but they're always adding to it. They're always enhancing the visuals too. It's yeah. actually so closer to 10 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So about... That is yeah, awesome. I'd say it was about 2013. Yeah. Yep. It originally came out as basically a uh, counter offer to Daisy. They were they were trying to yeah. compete head to head with Daisy, with just some different yeah. different components. Oh yeah. Yeah, and uh, that's really cool. Now, folks, we're going to be talking about a game here in just a quick second, and the game that we're going to be talking about. Come in with an open mind. Open your head to us. Let us fill your mind with thoughts of possibilities. Because the game we're going to talk about isn't a survival game per se. But it has the possibilities of being one. And in my opinion, it actually has a lot of elements. And that is, folks, what you probably have been here for. Or maybe you haven't been, but you're excited to hear about it. Starfield. Starfield is... Well, you know what, Jarl? Why don't you take it away? You seem like you've had a very good grasp of Starfield with all of your streams and stuff. What is Starfield? Starfield is Bethesda coming back to its roots. That's the core. Yes, it is a single-player RPG. If you loved Skyrim, Fallout 4, Oblivion, and Morrowind, then you'll love that. But what I love about it is they're going back to their older designs like Oblivion, Fallout New Vegas, and Morrowind. They're bringing back the fact that you have to do a skill to be able to level it up. So there's a lot of depth to the game and a lot of width because you could go 150 hours into the game before even touching the main storyline. It really only coaxes you in the very beginning with a couple quests, but then after that, it doesn't guide you as much. And I love that about it. Yeah, and that's there's so many cool things about Starfield. I have honestly um, played a lot of Starfield myself, and I actually truly enjoy it. Now, what we're going to do here, folks, is I am... Uh, going to be going listing off the things I think make uh, that are attributes that are possibilities for Starfield to be a survival game. 
And then I'm gonna let Jarl list off what he thinks is or isn't based off of my list. So let's go ahead and get right into it. So Starfield does have a lot of survival game attributes, even though it's not a survival game per se. There is an elaborate crafting system. You pretty much can craft any kind of component you can find out in the world that is actually listed as a resource and not miscellaneous. And I think you can actually even craft miscellaneous stuff. You can make your own food. You can harvest your own resources. There is a stamina system being the oxygen and CO2 levels. There's armor. There's clothing. You can modify your armors and your clothing. There are so many things, not to mention the exploration, the shipbuilding, the scanning, the um, exploring of the unique locations, the building of your bases on planets. There are so many elements to this game that actually could make it a pretty darn good survival game. What do you think about all that, girl? Well, one of the first things is it was just announced that the Creation Club is going to be coming out in 2024. It looks to be a similar time frame as Fallout 4, so we should expect it sometime between March and June. So that's not very far away. And every time Creation Club comes out, a survival mode comes out, which I think is needed. Although you have beds that you could sleep in for experience points, and you have foods that you could cook that'll give you an instant boost of health, there's really not a whole lot there as of now that make it a survival game, with the exception of the ability to craft medicines for illnesses and ailments. Although you can't make med packs, trauma packs, or emergency packs yet, that should as well be coming with mods later on when the creation engine launches for you Xbox players. I'm actually enjoying that mod right now on PC. But I think that's the only element as of now that feels real survival. And I will anticipate, I'm willing to bet my livelihood on it, that we'll see a survival mode release the moment that Creation Club comes out. And when that happens, all hands are off because then you'll have to sleep, you'll have to drink, you'll have to eat. And that's that's when all those coffee beans that you've been picking up will actually serve a purpose. <laughs> coffee, coffee. Um, but no, that's really interesting. You all kind of already answered my next question about what do you think would need to be added into uh, Starfield to make it a survival game. Um, and I totally agree. Um, I honestly think there should be some other situational stuff added too. Um, I think that uh, there should be definitely more of a emphasis if somebody were to wish to make it more survival that uh, your uh, starship needs fuel. I think yes. buying fuel and stuff. Although I wouldn't expect it to be super expensive, like, oh my god, I'm really counting my credits. It should be an expense that can either happen automatically every time you visit a spaceport, uh, or you have to do it manually if you just wish to top off. But it should happen when you're traveling around, and uh, I think that would definitely add to the survival aspect. They did originally uh, have fuel in it. But during in-house testing, they kept on running out of fuel in the middle of space with no ability to get rescued. And you're right, just stopping at a place could definitely do it. But I think if you just hardlock somebody, you should be able to fast travel to a s system. And then if you don't have the fuel to go further than that, then that's it. You don't get to go further until you refuel. That way you can, kind of like island hopping in World War II, you can system hop your way across refueling where you need to. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And there's a, there's something that happens that was happened in Elite Dangerous that I absolutely love to see, and there was the ability to hard, uh, harness your own fuel production. Uh, mind you, if in Elite Dangerous you could literally refill your entire ship, uh, if you had a good enough fuel bay. But I think in uh, a game where I've always been a person who believes in, if you introduce a survival mechanic, there has to be a way for the player to work or with that survival mechanic you can't just be all like by the way there's radiation there's no way to make radiation suits you're gonna die of radiation i know that's not the case in starfield but when games do that i feel cheated i feel kind of output so yeah definitely if there was starship fuel if there would have to be a way for maybe me to set up my own base i could produce produce it locally make my own refinery and you know what they say about oil it's black gold so Maybe ship fuel production could be a lucrative fact in the survival version of the game. 
Well, believe it or it's not, kind of like this is kind of based off a of NASA punk too, and we already have the technology to, with a very small installation, go to something that has water and make hydrogen-based fuel off, off of it. You don't have to have a massive refinery. You just have to have the water to do it. And since theoretically you need oxygen for your life support anyway, there's no reason why you couldn't have a small module that made fuel and oxygen for your ship. Oh yeah, definitely. I totally could see that. Uh, the other thing I think I would like to see in a survival mode or inside of a mod uh, as a survival feature is the solar system map has gravity wells for planets, the suns, and the moons. Um, I would like to see, instead of disabling fast travel or whatever uh, uh, when you're on ship, what if you make it so people just have to get outside of the large portion of the gravity well? Give ships a little indicator of how much the planet's gravity is affecting you. Once you get below a threshold, that's when you can go to other planets or out of the system. Um, I think that it would be a great immersive way to help people kind of simulate uh, having to actually travel um, in the game with a kind of time situation. I think. So they actually have something like that in the game, but I don't think people have a scope on how long it takes to get somewhere. Like it takes us three days to get to the moon. When you come out of grav space, you're actually pretty far away from the planet because the gravity well is too strong. You can fly to that planet. It's going to take you six hours. I've done it, but you can fly to that planet. You just can't go in the atmosphere, which is a bummer. <laughs> oh yeah. That, that is sad. That is sad. Um, yeah. I mean, so many cool ideas. And folks, if you've ever played any Bethesda games that have allow modding, it's crazy what people can do. Like, uh, just look at uh, Skyrim. They're making Sky Oblivion, Sky Morrowind, and it's a full-fledged rework just using the Skyrim engine of the two past games before that that we absolutely love. Um, yep. So They've know. got a Star Wars conversion mod for Starfield. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, I just want to quickly go over this. Starfield's engine is crazily awesome from what we have seen. I don't know the, the details about it, but we have seen people stack potatoes up to the entire cockpit of the frontier and let them all come out. I've seen somebody spawn in 100,000 melons inside of the Constellation's headquarters and literally run through it like they're swimming in melons, um, as weird as that sounds. Um... But to the community, to the chat, and if you wish to comment below, what crazy ideas can we think of that would make this Starfield game with mods one or one of the best survival games? Folks, go crazy. Don't be shy. This is Bethesda. Their modding stuff is absolutely awesome and how much they actually open up to the community. So quickly, Yar, what's one crazy idea you think this would be that this would make this an amazing survival game? Uh, I think you should be able to take ships and instead of selling them, steal them, take them down to your outposts and turn them into habs. Imagine an entire base built out of junk ships. That would be cool. Nice. Very nice. Very nice. I absolutely love that idea. I love that idea. I think you should be able to make space stations. Um, There are a lot of mods that are already doing that and there's hints that that's going to be a DLC like Outpost Space Ooh. Station. It's in the core files nice. that you can use the space station parts in the ship builder. Nice. I also want to see a mod that makes it so I can mine, frack, or haul an asteroid to... You uh, can already. The... You blow Ooh, up the really? asteroids, you get all the resources from it. You just got to loot them. Oh, I didn't know that. That is so Yeah, that's cool. the best so way to get from. resources. You just blow up all the asteroids and mine them. Nice. Very nice. Well, I think that's all we're going to be talking about when it comes to Starfield. And we're going to go ahead and move over to our community feedback. But folks, make sure you comment below about the Starfield stuff. We're really interested to see what you say about it. We have our community response, not feedback today. Our community, with, um, with so many survival games coming out and some already... There are a few the community seems to be quite excited about. Enshrouded, Doom Awakening, Arc 2, Sunken Lands, and much, much more. No idea of Sunken Lands. There you go. There, there you go, Red. There you go. Uh, it seems like an exciting time to be into survival games and for us to cover them. So once again, to our community, so uh, what survival game 
or update to a survival game you're most excited about? Let us know in the comments below or in chat right now as we're getting to wrap up. We're happy to hear from the community. But overall, go ahead, Carl. What game are you most excited for? Enshrouded, hands down. Give me that Dungeons, Dragons, Valheim combo and give me something to spend thousands of hours modeling a perfect city to my liking, and I'm in. Okay, definitely, definitely. What about you, Red? Is there a survival game you're super excited for? Um, <clears throat> You know, actually, I, I'm going to take the other side, which is I'm excited in general that there is... Um, there are new things coming out. People are trying different things. I think that um, the new games that are coming out are such early release that I, I really have to temper my expectations. But I'm excited at the fact that there are you know, continual work being done in this space. Mm -hmm. Nice. Very nice. Well, folks, let's go ahead and talk about... Uh, we're going to just be wrapping up. Today, we talked about a variety of games and all of them survival, except for one. But we did mention and kind of hint the fact that we would like to see it with mods or with the survival mode that y'all mentioned with the uh, thing coming from Bethesda itself, survival mode becoming a survival game itself in that situation. It's really cool because Daisy, Rust, and Shrouded, and even Starfield do have many elements they share across. And it's fun to talk about them in these ways. I hope you folks enjoyed our little experiment here. We might do it one more, one or more, two more times and see how everything goes. And remember, folks, um, feel free to go down below and follow one of these nice folks. And let them leave them a follow, leave them a like, pop into Yarl's streams and tell them that you think he looks pretty. And then if he's doing chat versus streamer, use the points to sabotage him. Uh, he loves that. Um, you know, and Red Falcon is a major supporter of Daisy mods. So if you are part of the Daisy community, go over and check out his mods or leave him a nice uh, thank you or maybe subscribe to his channel. Uh, it'd be very nice. Folks, and also at the very end of the thing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Hope you all have a good day. And let's go ahead and ask Yarl, what's up next episode? Next episode, we're going to be talking about the Long Dark, but more specifically, Thrive, not just Survive. It's always bothered me that in Long Dark, you're living out of cans and you're barely scraping by. But a little expansion that came out in June that I did not play because I was busy with other games makes it to where you can make a comfortable living. It's frontier living, delicious looking meals, not just moose intestines. So tune in then. It's going to be a lot of fun. Have a wonderful day, folks. Thank you for watching.